Hi, welcome to the Not The Top 20 podcast, the number one EFL podcast. And this is the first Monday pod of the season, recapping a bonkers weekend across the Championship League One and League Two. A weekend in which none of the title favourites won their opening match. And the record of the nine promoted teams from last season was six wins, two draws, one defeat. Yes. God bless our footballing pyramid. It's worth remembering that it's only been one game. This is a time for chin stroking and head scratching rather than knee jerking. At least that's the idea. But given there's already been a managerial departure after just one round of fixtures, <clears throat> maybe there's space for a little bit of knee jerking. And you guys know who is happy to jerk a knee if it feels right. It's George Ellick. Thank you very much. I thought you were going to say it's Preston North End. <laughs> <laughs> well, it is, isn't it? Yes. It is Preston North End. Let's get right into it. So much to cover on today's show. Uh, on Friday night, Preston hosted Sheffield United and Blades won 2-0. That means they are on one point after their three points on Friday night. Uh, a minus two points deduction wiped out immediately. But let's start with Preston and Ryan Lowe, who has left the club by mutual consent. They're very keen to make that clear. Following discussions that took place on Sunday, it was mutually agreed that there was an appropriate time for a change to be made, said the club statement. Our first ever made for TikTok content went out on Friday. It was George Ellick walking through Soho Square, <laughs> surrounded by pigeons, making championship predictions. And the first one was first manager to be sacked? Ryan Lowe. And he was. But he wasn't sacked. Was he? Wasn't he? Should we have called it first manager to leave? In hindsight, yes. The same thing. Uh, yeah, I mean, I didn't expect it to happen this quickly. It did feel like one of those where if they got off to a poor start and their their start in terms of fixtures was very, was very difficult, starting with Sheffield United on a, on opening day, then Sunderland, Swansea, Luton to come next three. Um, he was always going to be in the firing line. And part of that is because of the relationship that he's got with the fan base or the lack of where, you know, Ryan Lowe came in and I think a key part of this is Ryan Lowe came in having delivered very attractive attacking footballer both Berry and at Plymouth Argyle and the hope and expectation and the promises delivered from him is that he would do so again at Preston North End and I think at times he's kind of thought that is what he's delivering however the fan base at Preston feel like they aren't enjoying what they're watching they don't feel like it's the kind of football that they've been promised and therefore when you know I, I've got first hand experience of this fairly recently when a manager is telling you what they're seeing and it doesn't marry up with what you're seeing mm. it can be really frustrating the, the, the other side to this and you know if, if Ryan Lowe was sitting next to me on the sofa he probably would have hit me by now but it, given he's not the thing he would say is hold on I'm I've I'm managing a side with a bottom six budget I would assume we don't know the exact figures but a, a, you know a, cl a club that rarely spend big fees normally one relatively big fee um, for the level a summer normally around a kind of a million pound to four five hundred grand to a million pound mark um and i'm delivering mid-table finishes and i'm delivering a football that is overcoming that that budget mm. and therefore do i deserve to be sacked or do i deserve to, to be moved on or do i deserve a, a bit more respect from the fan base i think the answer can be yes i think the answer can be you know from a purely performance base does ryan low deserve more respect maybe but that still doesn't mean that it tallies with what Preston fans expect and what they want and what they're actually getting. So it's difficult because we saw what happened last season with Birmingham where they had a manager in John Eustace who was achieving pretty good results but not a particularly attractive style of play and they looked to tear it up very quickly with Wayne Rooney in this no no fear football and it ended in relegation. So if if the, the brief... You know, there are two ways that North End could go here. Is the brief, we go and we get someone who's got a track record of playing a more expansive style who we can bring in to do that or because they've, they've made the decision now is it more a case of we need to go and get someone who's going to be a steady hand who can solidify our position and make sure we're not in massive trouble later on in the campaign my hunch is they'll probably go for the former which is the, the stylistic um, changes and if that is the case then I really worry for them because they're going to be coming in with a couple of weeks left in the window with someone else having having built the squad and with someone else having had the whole of pre-season to do so. Mm. And you know, on, on opening day, there are a couple of examples. I would say Sheffield Wednesday and Oxford being two key ones in this league where you can see what a summer of work can do for a manager in terms of working with a squad and completely changing or developing what, what came before that. So 
I know Preston fans will be happy that it's come now, but question marks have to be asked why this mutual decision didn't come back in, in May. Yeah, spot on. It was a poor performance on Friday night, no doubt about that. Now, Sheffield United are a team with a lot of quality players and that was going against North End, but they didn't help themselves. Uh, the goals came from their mistakes and in possession, they looked pretty shorn of ideas. My main memory of Preston in possession from Friday night is Robbie Brady pumping in crosses from deep. Um, six crosses in total for Brady, in fact, and only one completed. So um, a really poor few days for Preston North End, but it's such early days in the season that we will only really be able to judge uh, the decision in a couple of months' time and we'll see how different this team can look under a new manager, whoever that may be. Um, just imagine the wave of feelings that must have washed over Blades fans in that away end at Deepdale because they've come off a horror season in the Premier League, no two ways about it, a points deduction to start this season, a bit of a messy summer, albeit quite an exciting last couple of weeks with the additions that they've made. The first game back, they are the least fancied of the three relegated sides from the Premier League and pretty early on in the first half, your Sheffield-born wonder kid midfielder puts you ahead, heavily deflected. Who cares? It must have felt incredible in that away end. And my general take on Blades is that they're going to be fun to watch. It was the the, sh the shift away from a three at the back and wing back system that we've come to kind of define Sheffield United and Chris Wilder by. Looks like it's going to be more 4-2-3-1, 4-3-3 type. And I, I think it will be fun. There's loads still to tweak and to add. Uh, and to improve on, they didn't slice Preston open and create chances at will. You know, that deflected strike and then Harmer lobbing um, Woodman after a, a terrible throw out from Woodman left him stranded were where the goals came from. But plenty, I think, to look forward to for Sheffield United fans. And, you know, as a starter for 10, you've got to be happy with that. Definitely. And at the time of recording being reported in the last hour or so that Jesper Raksaki is going through a, a medical at the club, which oh. is another bit of quality. And very quickly, it's starting to look like a a very good one to 11 from just a, on the pitch you know, on paper point of view if I stick Michael Cooper in goal yeah, there as it, well does that make you pretty excited yeah, yes it does um, so they, they look to me to be a side where they they seem to have put their problems behind them to an extent obviously with, with hope that they will get a takeover over the line fairly soon and yeah. that will enable them to, to kick on you know they had a two point deduction to start the season you know if you look at where Leeds are they're now you know level on points with Leeds so they've kind of made that up very quickly with their three points and Leeds just picking up the, the, the solitary point in terms of the game itself they were, they were pretty good like there were moments of quality from O'Hare uh, I thought for Harmer he was not his marauding best but the but the quality of the touch um, to trap Woodman well firstly the anticipation to see what Woodman was going to do then the touch to, to set himself up for the finish it was you know brilliant from him in order to create that chance Kiefer Moore missed an absolute sitter as well to make it to make it 3-0 so low to like with Sheffield United I'm fairly confident that they're going to be okay and whoever's doing their recruitment is doing a pretty good job of it whether that's Chris Wilder or someone mm. else so it wasn't vintage by any stretch but it was very comfortable and not far from them Sheffield Wednesday they are the biggest winner of match day one note that I'm not saying they're top of the league because we don't look at the league table for a couple of weeks how many games what, just the one actually no no how many games until you look at it because it used to be the thing that I think papers didn't used to publish the league table till three games love that from them but I think it should be more like eight eight's eight. too many five well we need to make a decision now basically because the listeners will pick us up on it if next week I say <laughs> top of league one Huddersfield three call it three we're, we're traditionalists I'm going to forget I, I, I don't have to incident. like it Wednesday, the biggest winner of match day one mm. and an absolute bloodbath. A 4-0 win against Argyle with what felt like the whole world watching as this one was the, the televised game on Sunday afternoon. Uh, Wayne Rooney's first game in charge of Plymouth Argyle. Uh, per Jamie Kemp, who works for Opta, uh, 30 shots, 62 touches in the opposition box for Wednesday. 4.85 expected goals generated more than any side managed in a championship game last season. Bloodbath. Yeah, total bloodbath. It was... Uh, the, the, the gap between these two sides was absolutely massive. Um, you know, we'll get on to Argyle and a torrid start for Wayne Rooney in a second. But I think we have to give Danny Royal credit where you know, he came in last season and did such an amazing job. I think you and I were both quite surprised when we were doing our 1-24s that we looked at the underlying numbers and, you know... The, 
the XG data for Wednesday wasn't anywhere near as yeah. um, persuasive as the results were at the back end of last season. And that kind of gave you pause for thought. Well, were they just running a bit hot? Were, was it variance? Was Danny Roll, you know, were we getting overexcited about a guy uh, off the back of not enough evidence? But I think we saw yesterday, and there'll be people who say, you know, our guy were terrible. And that, that can be true. That doesn't change the fact that Sheffield Wednesday were absolutely sensational in terms yeah. of what they were able to do. It felt quite easy. It felt like all they really had to do was get the ball into Bannon, Bannon to set one of the um, either the wingers or the fullbacks down the flanks and then look, get the head up and find the, the player in the middle of the, of the box because as Wayne Rooney said afterwards, they're defending from cutbacks, they're defending from crosses was absolutely terrible. They didn't seem to have any awareness whatsoever as to where the opposition players were and who they were meant to be picking up. And I'd even say the, the laziness, like especially even that Michael Smith goal at the end where Barley Mumba's kind of standing on ceremony and he's mm. just, he just stands three yards away from Smith and kind of watches him do what he's doing. It, it's not really good enough, but I thought Wednesday were were great in terms of, of how direct they were, of how they were tidy in possession, but there was absolutely no willingness to retain the ball for any long periods of time. It was more a case of getting it forward, getting it into Bar- ba- uh, Bannon and being direct in terms of trying to get into the final third. And that's why they were able to get in the box so often, why they were able to create the chances they were, they were able to create. Massive, I think, for Jamal Lowe to get off the off the mark with his first goal for the club and other players picking up where they left off. And then Ingleson, the, the, the attack midfield player, looked really sharp as well. So it's it's just a 10 out of 10 opening day mm. um, for, for Wednesday. And I guess we'll see in the coming weeks just how bad Argyle actually are and how much that played a part in this. Yeah, because, I mean, issues all over the pitch. Um, starting at the top of it, in possession, in attack, in the first half, I had the sense that if they could execute well on the counter-attack, then there were chances for them. But it was just pure individualism. There was no... Th- those attacking players just weren't on the same wavelength when they did try and combine. Um, that's the wide players, Sissoko and, and Whitaker, and then Tijani and Bunda, who, who were playing through the middle. Behind them, they looked a beat off it in, in duels all over the park. Um, and against an energetic side like Sheffield Wednesday, that's a massive problem. And then at the back, as you say, just a, a lot of confusion, poor shape, um, overwhelmed really. Um, I think it's worth pointing out there was some quite fun off-ball movement from Sheffield Wednesday. There's a bit more fluidity in their play with Royal having had um, you know, the whole summer to work on stuff like this, which he, he, he didn't have last season coming in when they were rock bottom. Um, like Jan Valery playing right back in particular was very notable for taking up some um, quite fun positions that confused um, Argyle, Ingleson as well, in, in particular for the first goal, making a really good forward run. Um, and just just Argyle defenders being moved around by the movement off the ball of Wednesday players. And then, of course, you need the quality on it. And that's what Bannon was able to provide. So tough a test for them to come, but what a start for them. The, the issues for Argyle compounded by... The absence of Michael Cooper, their goalkeeper, who's absolutely excellent, who may be off, still a bit of uncertainty there. It's been linked to a Sheffield United, uh, and the fact that two of their starting 11s names on the back of their shirt were spelt wrong, <laughs> which just added embarrassment to defeat, uh, to insult, to injury. About as poor a start to the season as they could have had. Yeah, I think we should talk a little bit about Rooney off the back of this as well, because. You know, I said in the one to twenty fours that I thought maybe people had written them off a bit early. I still think, even off the back of yesterday, that some people seem seem to see that as justification for doing so. And I'd still say it's a bit early for that. My hunch is that our guard as a club, and that's Rooney and the coaching staff and the players, will learn a lot more through yesterday's humbling than they would have done through a regulation kind of one nil, two nil defeat where they weren't um, dispatched. I think he made loads of bad decisions. I think you know we'll talk about for example, the Oxford game in a second, where nine of the 11 players from Wembley started that game, despite double-figured 11 players coming in in the summer. For Rooney to to come out on opening day and play, what, Palson, Ogbeta, Yabi, Sissoko, um, Tajani. And when you look at the players who came off the bench, it's Mumba, Wright, Hardy. Piers didn't come off the bench, Edwards, Randall. Like, Mm. to try and shift so quickly and introduce so many new players into a starting lineup on opening day away in a really tough game against Wednesday just seems incredibly naive and they look like a team who were kind of been thrown together last minute I think it's a really hard thing to do I think they're entitled to improve off the back of that um, but I, I still wouldn't be massively surprised if Argyle learn and kind of find their way in the next few weeks rather than this going to be a disaster for him mm. like I, I've seen so much stuff in recent weeks about 
how Derby was all because of Rossinha. And, and I do think there's something about the Derby appointment where because Wayne Rooney was not only a player, but kind of the senior player at Derby and therefore very much part of that group before he was appointed, that may have had an impact in terms of what he was able to do when he stepped up to be their head coach or their manager. Whereas here, again, he's kind of coming in slightly cold. And to Although within that context, following a really unpopular previous manager yeah. is a bit of a leg up. Like you're almost, you, you get that little boost because you're not the, the guy from but before. This is... Like all the... All of the noises the whole summer have been like breath of fresh air. Everyone's loving it. But this everyone's is really I'm buzzing for this. Getting to is that Ian Foster seemed, was seemingly like an, an overwhelmingly negative influence around the club. So therefore, I was really disappointed and surprised to see the way that Rooney spoke about his players after the game, where he just threw them under the bus and said, "You know, we've been working on stopping cutbacks, and they weren't able to do it. You know, I, I'm at a loss to explain why they weren't able to to carry out our instructions. Like to do that on after opening day." feels like you're immediately saying like this isn't me this isn't me this is them yeah. and that i think could be his undoing and if the, if this does spiral and if the next three or four or five performances remain the same i don't think those comments after the game are going to have helped um but it feels like argyle or a club who are going to be desperate like absolutely desperate not to sack him uh, anytime soon and to try and make this work so um, unlike other clubs where you're looking at probably two or three games and they'll pull the plug I'd be really surprised if that's the case with Argyle Millwall 2 Watford 3 was a bonkers game of football even beyond the scoreline itself which reflects that bonkers because not a huge amount had happened in the first portion of the game until Edo Kayembe scored an Olympic goal direct from a corner do you Pro- think he meant it? Uh, I'd be surprised if he did. I thought on first glance maybe, but the fact that like four Watford players all charged the fast to the sorry to the near post on delivery suggests yeah. to me it was meant to be like a just drop it on that near post. Yeah, I, I, I'm not sure. Doesn't matter if I believe anyone's really shooting from a corner. Like occasionally, yeah, kind of seem to Joe into Joe Jacobson. Well, I, I think even Jacobson, like the majority of his are just he's aiming for a cross that goes inside the near post but that's because he's trying to get the flick on oh. like anyway uh, not important it was a, a fairly tough scene for new Millwall keeper Lucas Jensen who was absolutely excellent it should be said in League One for Lincoln last season no particular reason why he would not be able to step up to the championship but it wasn't a good start for him being beaten by a Chak for Tadze free kick from 35 yards brilliant brilliant strike of course but again you probably want your keeper getting across to that 2-0 to Watford sort of somehow I guess or, or certainly somehow based on, on the balance of play at that point Millwall coming roaring back with Duncan Watmore at the double you know all eyes on for example uh, Macaulay Langstaff on players like Emaku or Romain Esser these guys who we're hoping will, will come into the team and have an impact on Millwall going forward this season but it's someone like Watmore who's who's probably the sort of player that fans they, they quite rate, but they probably rate more as a bench option or a squad player. And there he was, working hard, scoring two goals, constant movement, decent finishing as well. I must admit, Watford's shape for both Millwall goals, considering they were defending a two and then a one goal lead, was pretty interesting, I think it's fair to say. Um, but they won the game. They won the game again, ha- having, you know, with the momentum seemingly all with Millwall. They go down the other end in injury time. Delhi Bashiru with a nice little bit of, uh, well, a nice little carry, dip inside, a shot deflected, and Ryvich, Ryvich had moved quicker than any Millwall defender and, and headed it in. And I just love the idea that, like, let's be clear, Ryvich is not a popular Watford FC player. Um, I don't think that the fans really rate him based on what I've, I've heard and read. I just love to know what percentage of that Watford away end at the den where away teams rarely win, or so it feels, will have either said or written something this summer like, Ryovic is not good enough. Like, we need to replace him or get a better one. And there he is, arms out, winning it at the death in the den. That's that's beautiful. And how many of them on their walk back to the station or back to their cars were saying, I hope that's the last time he ever plays for us. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, it, it's such a weird game, this, where... Watford win and take three points. But from my, you know, we had them for 24th and I won to 24th. So I was, and Millwall 23rd. Yes. Um, and I was at, you know, I, I, I was following this game on my phone whilst at, at a game. And when I saw this coming through, I was like, oh my God, have we got this really wrong? And then you watch the game back and you look at everything and you're like, there are, there are 
way more worries that come out of this for, for, for Watford in my mind than, than positives like a, a goal from a corner a brilliant free kick from 35 yards and a deflected um, effort that loops onto onto Rivic's head albeit with, with some quite good movement like Millwall created seven big chances as per Opta in this game they missed five of them um, they were as you say the, the defensive shape from Watford was, was pretty poor throughout and they really struggled to create anything by deign of any creativity it was set pieces and, and, and a bit of fortune so um, yeah I wouldn't say this is a, a result necessarily that that um, changes my mind about their uh, prospects for the coming season for Millwall I, I think that you know the, from 2-0 down in a game it's it's kind of easier to, to look okay um, frustration from their from their finishing I noted that um, Cordy Langstaff came on to make his debut uh, had half an hour on the pitch and touched ball five times mm-hmm. um, had 0% aerial win rate from two which is kind of why I'm worried about him and it feels like he's going to come on in these games and really struggle to make an impact because of the style of play um, but yeah, frustration for Millwall and Watford. We'll hope they can build on this, but still, I came in today being like, just be positive for once. And I've just really doubled down. That's okay. If That's you say okay. so. Thank I, you. I think it'd be a bit weird if you were positive about every team. Yeah. I'd start, I'd actually think it'd be a really bad listen. Three points. Uh, I was at Loftus Road to see... When are we getting to the big one? The first hat... This is the big one. Oh. The first hat-trick of the EFL season, scored by Josh Madger of West Brom beating QPR 3-1. I was in the upper loft for this one with the QPR fans and a lot of excitement pre-game, uh, mostly extinguished by the hour mark when West Brom were 2-1 up. And frankly, there wasn't a huge amount between the two teams, between both boxes, which is broadly what you would have expected, I think. The difference was the, the finishing. Josh Madger, three shots, three goals. Uh, he played 200 minutes last season, missed so much of the campaign through injury. And now we're being reminded, and it's been a few years since we've we've really seen this in England, did score 15 for Bordeaux in Ligue 2 in a season, that he is a really sharp finisher. He's a pretty intelligent player as well. He's got a really good first touch. He can link play. He's not physically dominant and he's not hugely speedy, I wouldn't say, but I think he's a, a really exciting option for West Brom to have having last season played without a finisher basically and that Mm. being an issue for them going forward so two great headers one instinctive close range volley an absolute sniper and of course we are like intrinsically and emotionally linked to Josh Madger because he became famous on Netflix and it was also as did we our Netflix debut Mm. an episode of Sunderland Till I Die season one all about Madger the goals that he was scoring for Sunderland and then quite quickly the fact that he was, uh, or, or certainly his agent, was angling for a move away and, and caused much consternation. And there they just ran in a little clip of us in the Sky Sports studio from back in the day. Only me talking though. Yeah, me just standing there like you a had a, You're an extra. Right? Stitched you right up with the edit speak. as well. They did. They did? They did. Yeah, they clipped me up saying that he was the best finisher in the world, <laughs> which Saturday shows maybe he is. Yeah. Uh, people are wondering when's our next Netflix experience. We don't know. We don't know. They haven't been in touch. Ollie Anderson said, Netflix Madger is back, yeah. uh, which I liked. Um, that was a good <laughs> tweet. And what else did I see? I saw a nice assist from a, a new youngster uh, to, to stick on the radar, Ryan Coley of that was a great ball. QPR. He's been at the club since he was eight. He's 19 years old. He played in the, in the chair role off the left, but he's a sort of technical number 10 type pl- profile rather than a, a speedster or a 1v1 um, dribbler. Brilliant cross to the late arriving Lucas Anderson, who again looked really quality on the ball, Anderson, and, and showed some intelligent movement. QPR just looked really light up top. Chair is out injured at the moment. The new lad, Salah, had an, a horrible debut, really tough time. Fre- Frey came on and had a complete air kick when well placed. Um, didn't look any sharper than he did last season. And, you know, we, we hope, or at least I hope, that Thifuentes a bit like Danny Rowe, gets backed to the tune of a couple of fresh faces in, in attacking areas. And Karamoko Dembele's been linked, which would be really exciting. Koki Saito as well, Japanese player, has been linked as well. They, they need some reinforcements. Um, but an amazing afternoon for West Brom. They only won six away games in 23 last season. So pretty significant after a bit of a strange last month or two to, to get off with a win. Tom Fellows mm. was the name of the second half. His contribution to both the second and the third goal was very exciting. Um, 
we had him in our 21 under 2021 20, list in June. And I talked about this incredible, repeatable skill that he has, which allows him to get to the byline and either float crosses in with his right foot or often uh, he'll cut it back to the penalty spot as well. You coined it on that show, the fellow's step. And we saw it in action here again. Yeah, I mean, he, he was that bit of quality <clears throat> from out wide that was the difference, really, and enabled mm. Madrid to get not only the second goal, but also the third, too. Um, I think for, for West Brom, as you say, it's been a weird couple of weeks and, and probably quite a lot of negativity around their transfer business. But then the team comes out on Saturday and it's it's still very, very good. Um, it's the depth that you're worried about. When you look at the bench, there isn't much there. And that's where you think they have to add some quality in the next few weeks. But... You know, for Carlos Corboran, he's just still kind of firefighting. He's working in an environment where players who are pretty important to him get taken away. He's not really given any quality to work with and he still goes to QPR, a side who was so good under Cifuentes last time out and puts in a really good performance and wins 3-1. They dominate the ball um, pretty well. Interested to know what you made of Hegem, the uh, kind of left-sided defender who played left-back. Great fun. Um, Craig Bradley, who's been part of our transfer coverage on NTG20.com this summer, he, he did the initial report on Hegan when he signed and he made a very unusual player comparison like there's, there's certain players that are often used as the the sort of prototype for he's a bit like um, Thierry Henry for, yeah. for example right um, for Hegan he wrote he reminds me a bit of Dan Byrne and I was like that's absolutely insane and it's absolutely spot on he looks just like Dan Byrne he's really really tall but he's playing left back here I think he'll, he'll play left centre back if and when they get another left back in. But he did a good job and, and you know, he galloped up the flank and, and sort of hooked in a cross that was headed in by Madger. I thought he looked good. I, I thought um, all of their players played just pretty well and Madger was the difference. There's a very good write-up from Loft for Words yes. that's kind of gone a bit viral. I only read out one line where he says, every year Norway has sent the UK a Christmas tree to show their gratitude for support in the Second World War. And here it is, four months early, massive bastard playing left back, would you believe? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, incredible. I, I did get the sense of the the air being let out the balloon a little bit from the QPR fans, who sort of realising that as exciting uh, as, as they can be under Cifuentes, that um, you know they're still going to play against teams like West Brom, who are equally well-drilled. Um, I think probably quite tough to swallow having a striker playing for the opposition who scored one goal last season scoring a hat-trick mm. after 70 minutes um, but great day for West Brom uh, Cardiff lost 2-0 at home to Sunderland slate wiped clean for Sunderland after a really poor we're doing away wins yeah no it's right. then we'll do some home wins okay away wins are more impressive just thought we'd lead it you know it's match of the day running order all over again I, I still don't know are you talking about Black, are you talking about Blackburn didn't you used to support Blackburn as a kid mm, not really uh, anyway you did uh, slate wiped clean for Sunderland after horrendous second half of last season. We can forget that for now. Great start for... We've got to update the pronunciation of the Sunderland manager's name. I can't really believe this, but I think because he's Breton, right. there's different pronunciations, and the S's are to be pronounced. So it's Regis. Regis Lebris. Regis Lebris. You say it how you like, but that's how we're going. Regis. Yeah. Nice. Great start for him. Also the wise. name of the company that run our office. Yeah. Yeah. I was going to say good company, but I think jury's still out. Great. <laughs> we pay them for an office space and that's what we get. Yeah. Outside of that. <laughs> not much management. Not my favourite brand. Well, that's not great for Regis. Management issues. Yeah, that's true. Uh, they were pretty good, I thought. Um, Sunderland. Um, it was a game where uh, 09 gave them the lead fairly early through a set piece. Cardiff dominated the ball from there, which kind of surprised me to an extent. Sunderland basically happy to set off an attack in transition. I don't know if that is by design or if that's something where that was kind of dictated by them going ahead early. Um, and, you know, Cardiff missed some opportunities during the game. Robinson had a decent chance. Ramsey had a decent chance. But for the most part, Sunderland kept them fairly quiet. And then some brilliant play by Joe Bellingham, mm. um, where you and I sat on these very sofas a couple of months ago to do 21 under 21. Barely moved since. No, I mentioned there that Bellingham had this incredible knack of running backwards towards goal, doing these like hook slide tackles and then kind of being able to recycle and, and, and launch attacks from there. And that's exactly what he did for this. Yeah. So well done me. Um, he passed it to Jack Clark, who Jack Clark did what he does, this time wearing a hairband, uh, just cut inside with his right foot and fired it low into the far corner. So some quality from Bellingham. Delighted to see him playing a little bit deeper. I, I yeah. just don't think he's someone who should be a striker. I think he is at his best 
when he has space uh, in front of him to run into uh, Mayenda, the, the, the teenage striker, missed a really good opportunity with a one-on-one. But I think given the positivity around Cardiff heading into the season, given the slight concerns around Sunderland heading into the season, for Sunderland to, to win this and do so fairly comfortably, new signing Alan Brown mm. uh, offering something in midfield as well, it's a, it's a really solid start for them. Yeah, and Cardiff more or less dominated the ball, which is surprising in a sense based on the style of play of, of both sides last season. I, I wouldn't say that they looked particularly coherent in those final moments, Cardiff. That's something they need to work on. I, I don't think the front line was looking quite as strong as I was expecting it to based on the, the excitement around their, their transfer business. And, I, and I'm sure as the summer signings start to bed in, you know, things will change. I don't expect Tanner to start on the right. I don't expect Callum Robinson to start up top um, too often from this point. But I quite like seeing Sunderland looking solid in a deeper set shape out of possession and being able to then break quickly with Roberts and Clark and their ball carrying, with Bellingham and his ball carrying through the middle, with Dan Neal able to play really good forward passes um, uh, as well. So I quite I quite liked that Sunderland won this way. And uh, and also with Sirkin and Hume, they've got two full-backs who are so yes. good depending one-on-one, but also have the, the distribution from deep that really enables them to kind of still spring from the back. So Great to see Sirkin back. Really Missed good. Almost the whole of last season. Mm. Brilliant. OK, time to talk about home teams that won by two clear goals. George, Blackburn for Derby 2. <laughs> this was enjoyable on Friday night. About five more goals than I expected. Yeah. Yes, me too. I, I backed under two and a half in this game, which was fun. Um, yeah, I mean, Derby, I think, were, were very poor. Like, Not to take anything away from Blackburn. We should say, you know, Rovers, a lot of negativity coming into the season. Um it looks to me, I mean, with John Eustace, who's a manager, who I think still, in our mind at least, has is very promising and, and could still be, you know, not just solid, but very, very good for the level. Um, he seems to have built a Blackburn side who are solid defensively in open play and able to be pretty exciting um, going forward as yeah. well. And they started with, with Gay up front, who seemed like a, a real live wire, finishing, maybe let him down a little bit, but able to, to kind of muster his way onto the ball in advanced areas. Ran the channels really well, um, generally very solid. Tyree Stolen scored the first goal with a very nice finish as well. You know, for, for Derby, their only source of basically any attacking threat whatsoever was from set pieces. You know, 1.08 expected goals uh, total, but 0.75 of that was from set pieces. And both of their goals from, from Nelson and Wilson were, were also from set pieces as well. We're in an interesting situation with with, with Rovers where... I think the assumption when they brought Gay and Ahashi in was that they were bringing in the replacements for Sammy Smodix and Vyman as well, I should say. But Smodix is still there and Smodix, unlike other players in the championship who might be on their way out, came off the bench and scored a, a really nicely taken goal. But then Vyman and Ahashi also scored too. So suddenly right. they've got so many options to play up front, either in a in a two or um, in a one, but also Vyman. Smodix, Ahashi, all these players that look like they can probably either play as a number 10 as well. So Eustace is kind of sport for choice right now. How that looks in a few weeks' time, we'll have to see. But I was really impressed by them. Ahashi's finish was, was obviously the pick of the bunch. Mm. The lovely little dink late on. It was like, if you could have... If you could fuse the performance of Gay and the performance of Ahashi off the bench, mm. you'd have the best striker in the league. I thought Gay's... Movement and pace looked really good from the start. Uh, stretched the defence. Uh, it's finishing less so, but still positive signs there. And then Ohashi came on, showed great first touch, level of composure in front of goal, played with his head up. Um, really excited about that, I must say. And, and um, Kay on the squad pointing out that Ohashi has scored th- uh, three opening day goals in a row, um, both over in Japan in 2023 and 2024. And then today as well with three separate clubs as well. So fantastic introduction to the league for him. I was pleased to see one of my guilty pleasures, Tyree Stolen, getting an early goal as well. I, I will always believe that he can and will be a top championship attacking player. Probably no higher than that, to be honest with you, given some of his uh, size deficiencies. But <laughs> I really think a versatile forward player who can impact the game uh, with goals, with creativity, with pressing... Uh, and I really hope that Eustace can can kind of unlock another level out of him. It was a good finish. Still only 22. Still only 22. And Do- also mentioned for Hayden Carter's assist. Oh! Where he kind of won the ball back and just carried on running forward and then found, it, found himself, himself forward again. Little chop. So good. Stood up to the back post for Vyman to head in. Yeah, loved it. Okay. Derby, Derby. 
among many other things you could say about their performance, one thing that's most clear for me, they are going to need a much better game plan when they are chasing football matches because they were only behind for 10% mm. of total minutes last season, the lowest in League One. They were very rarely in this scenario. It is likely that this season they will spend a lot more time chasing games. They cannot be that open. They can't go from trying to be compact and solid to going gung-ho when they need to chase. There needs to be a, a few more gears in between, I think, because you know we're waxing lyrical about Blackburn's attacking play towards the end. But frankly, if every team was able to attack against a defence like that with so few numbers back and so much space, I think most championship teams would have carved them open. So lots to work on there for Derby. <clears throat> now, up in Oxfordshire, there was a game at the Cassam Stadium. It was the first championship game played by Oxford United, the first second-tier game, I should say, because it wasn't called the Championship Division back one. in 1998-99. Uh, Oxford United took on Norwich City and thumped them by two goals to nil. Yeah, this was very good. <laughs> this, this went better than I possibly could have anticipated it was going to go, where you know, when the teams came out and I saw it was Hanley and Duffy at centre-back for Norwich and that John Rowe had seemingly gone on strike that morning, I, I did fancy us. But I kind of thought the way it would look, especially with those two centre-backs and with Doyle playing left-back, was that we would drop in, we would soak, we'd let them have the ball and we would look to spring with, with Harris and, and, and Placetta, you know, the, and Goodrum, the pace we had in that forward line. But very quickly it became evident that we were not going to play we, we were not going to be dictated by the way that Norwich played and we were going to take the game to them. And that was what was so impressive. Like the, the press from Des Buckingham's Oxford was so effective. And, you know, even though the, the scoreline was 2-0, you, you know, you may look at the expected goals numbers and it's not there's not a huge divide. But anyone at the stadium, Norwich fans included, will tell you there was a, a huge gulf between the, the two teams. Norwich fans will, will believe that's due to their them being incredibly poor on the day, which they were. But in my mind, it's not, you know, the, the two-line scoreline probably doesn't, doesn't do justice to the levels between the two sides. That was how co how cosy it was. Norwich's threat came from set pieces where Marcelino Nunez's corners were absolutely superb <laughs> and, and they looked dangerous from those. But apart from that, after kind of the 10th minute, it was it was one-way traffic. Uh, Mark Harris scored the first where he kind of sat Grant Hanley down. It looked pretty soft for Mahanley to go down. It didn't yep. look like a foul whatsoever. Yeah. And he kind of uh, tried to hit into the bottom left-hand corner and it squeezed through Gunn's legs. After that, um, uh, uh, Brannigan hit the hit the crossbar. A few other opportunities before a really nice bit of play. The ball shifted out to Goodrum. Goodrum back inside to Rodriguez. Rodriguez out to uh, Sam Long. Sam Long with a brilliant ball uh, in, into Cameron Brannigan, who first time put it past Gunn. And it was you know the least that Oxford deserved at that point. And then kind of Olays followed as Oxford knocked the ball around. Um, much to the, the frustration of, of Norwich. Um, it was just as complete a performance. And, and I think as an Oxford fan, our last five games have been beating Exeter away on final day to force our way into the playoffs, beating Peterborough over two legs, beating Bolton at Wembley, and then beating Norwich 2-0 in, 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 the, in the comfortable way that we did. I can't think there, there have been five as impressive performances under pressure um, in my time supporting the club. Like, absolutely remarkable. And I've gone from even this summer, I would say, being like fairly juries out on, on Buckingham. Like, did he manage just to get it right for a short period of time at the back end of the last season? To then watching our game on Saturday, and now I'm wondering, like, have we got a proper one here? Have we got mm. a guy who's, who's destined for, for, for the very top? Because we were so well drilled, and the uh, it felt like every player knew their job. The team selection of, you know, despite bringing in 11 players, playing nine of the 11 that played at Wembley, Josh Murphy, the key player that day, being one of the two that didn't play because he decided not to join the club. And just a massive step up on, on what we've seen before. So, yeah, I mean, it was an unbelievable day to be part of. Um, the Yellow Army, who, who organised a lot of the um, fan displays at the club, did brilliantly with um, a big Buckingham flag before the game started. Fireworks, pyro, flames. It was all happening and it was just amazing to be back there. Um, welcome to hell. Yeah. Oxford United. Welcome to hell. It's only got three sides. Uh, three stands, I should say. Um, from a Norwich perspective, it's, it's a massive concern. Like they were, it's horrible. They, they were really bad. Like they were really bad. <laughs> Mate, Shane Duffy had ninety-three touches, right? I'm amazed he had that many. Cause the, the next most for Norwich was Nunez with sixty-four. So he had thirty touches more than any other player. That reeks of 
a game plan from Oxford, which was probably pick up everyone else, let Duffy have it and see what he can do. On the flip side of that, Sargent played 90 minutes and touched the ball 12 times. Science came off on the 90th minute, had eight touches of the ball. Those are their two most dangerous attacking players. Did not see the football. Mm. Couldn't get it to them. No, and I, but it, like, they didn't know how to do it. Like The only times they looked a little bit dangerous in open play was when they were a bit more patient on the ball and they played through the press and then suddenly they, they get into space. But they were really direct for the most part. It was a case of of basically trying to, to get it forward too quickly and Oxford dealt with it really simply. Like Will Volks sitting in midfield with Brannigan playing a little bit ahead of him and then Rodriguez ahead of him. Volks just dominated the midfield. The amount of times he, he would pick up loose balls, interceptions, you know, break break down play and then and then be able to use it wisely. Like he was a massive game changer. Um there's some news coming out of Norwich in the last since we started recording actually. That oh yeah, hold on. Let's see if I'm getting it in my ear. Uh... No, what is it? Takeover. What? Yes, gone through. Ah. So, I mean, whether this has had some impact on their business this summer, you would expect it probably has. Um, Norfolk Holdings reaches an agreement to enable majority control of Norwich City. Norwich City Makes um, it sound like a, a local conglomerate of locals. Yeah, Norfolk Holdings. maybe it is. Um, I think probably not, actually. No. I mean, so, I'm seeing American flags. Are you? Yep. Okay. So, um, 85% of the club now, Delia and Michael, um, honorary... Uh, was it say president? I think. So uh, it's your man, life president. It's your man Atan- Atanasio, who's been there as a minority shareholder for quite a while. He's stepping up. Here he is. Yeah. So th- that might have an impact in terms of what they do between now and the end of the month, because um, it has been quiet in terms of incomings. So we will see in that regard. But um, fair to say that John Rowe is no longer the reason that they breathe, the reason that they still believe. He's the reason why they don't believe. I think fuming at the moment. With um, him. Yeah. Yeah. Very poor. So. I, you do fear for them and, and they definitely played their part in being pretty bad but I would still say that the performance from Oxford was just of a really high quality and I you know, going into Saturday's game I was like we have to get like 45 points this season how are we going to do that and watching that I was like we're going to be fine Yeah, Premier League here we come mm. next season I'm not going to support a team in the EFL anymore yeah. that's a joke before you Josh Madger me other winners included Middlesbrough Opening day win, 1-0 at home to Swansea. I'll start with a note on Swans. I couldn't help but chuckle uh, that my main concern as raised in the 1-24s was defensively for Swansea and in particular defensive transition. And the first highlight that I saw of their season was Borough keeper Dieng catching a corner and then kicking the ball forward. Yeah. And uh, there was Isaiah Jones running clear. The Swansea keeper, Vigaru, rushing miles out, getting nowhere near it, and Jones lobbing it and just missing the target. Uh, so still fair to say I've got a little uh, concern about how Swans are going to go about being both a really good possession-based team in attack that also is able to stifle the opposition from creating chances. Uh, in the end, the goal was a, was a penalty. Uh Isaiah Jones, again, who was a threat all game, coming in off the right side, dribbling into the box. Little nibble from the youngster Azim Abdullahi. Penalty scored by Emmanuel Latalath. Now, he has scored in seven straight games. That equals the longest scoring run in the championship post-rebrand, joining Charlie Austin in 2012, Jordan Rhodes in 2013, and Alexander Mitrovic in 2021. Pretty good company. Where did I learn that? On NTT20.com. <laughs> Specifically, the weekend notes post that went out first thing this morning will go out first thing every Monday, all season. New format to it this season. Sam's done an incredible job revamping it. Way more uh, bite-sized info, much more easily consumed and completely free for all all subscribers to NTT20.com. Uh, and a huge addition, I think, although I would say it, to the EFL content landscape. Uh, that's weekend notes on ntt20.com. Swansea, they didn't have a shot until the 63rd minute. They didn't have a shot from open play until the 89th minute. It was a, it was a confident Middlesbrough performance and win, uh, and they could have extended it. In particular, Jones with one of those really selfish bits of play, running at the goalkeeper with Bergsorg alongside him, and trying to score himself instead of rolling it across to Bergsorg and the ball being cleared off the line. And that is right up there in my top three biggest hates in football. So 
yep, sad because I, I wanted to do a big bit on why I think it could be Izzy Jones' season. I think he could be Got square it, mate. massive, but I'm just so angry with him mm. that I refuse. I also thought the Bergs did quite well to check his run, but then it was still on, yeah. even when he shot yeah. for the cutback. But no. Uh, another 1-0 home win came in the Potteries, at the Potteries. In the Potteries. In the Potteries at Stoke. At Stoke. They beat Cov 1-0. They did, um, through substitute Lewis Baker, um, who scored having kind of made it and then and then finished it off down the right-hand channel. Very poor defending, I would say, from Bidwell, who was kind of standing on ceremony, watching events unfold around him. Baker um, came on for Berger. Ah, oh, nice. Yeah. Where was a candlestick maker? <laughs> <laughs> um, it was... Unused sub. It was uh, pretty underwhelming, I would say, from Coventry, especially in the first half, where Stoke... Uh, were by far the better side. Um, Coventry didn't really manage to create a great deal. Pretty underwhelming uh, debuts from Efren Mason Clark and Jack Radoni, who I am positive will make have a much more positive impact in time. Um, but maybe this is it. Maybe because we finally said that Stoke were going to be relatively poor on our 124s. This is the season mm -hmm. where they're going to be promotion challengers because they were the better side. And even though the goal came fairly late, uh, it was it was deserved. So. Um, yeah, a good start for Stephen Schumacher, who I think is one of those managers that really needs a strong start. Because I think if they were to start poorly, um, given that he didn't, you know, he kept Stoke up last season relatively comfortably, but it, it wasn't like a Real or a Cifuentes impact mm. that, that saw a massive buy-in from the fans. So, um, yeah, a decent start for them. Uh, Kov have Oxford on Friday night live on Sky, which should be interesting given both of their starts. Mark Robbins... The yes. longest serving championship manager, seven years and so five good. months. Yeah. After Lowe's departure, the second longest serving championship manager is Paul Warren, one year and ten months. Save Mark Robbins. He should be made a listed manager. You can't make any alterations to it. Can't sack him. <laughs> He's not allowed to change. He has to be there forever. Um, yeah, both teams missing player. I, I'd, I'd like to see this game played again in like four weeks when everyone's available because... Um, Kov were missing Ben Sheaf and Hadji Wright. Stoke were also missing quite a few, including Junho Bay. I mean, Gooch played left wing, 18-year-old Tezgal up front. So really impressive for them and, and a strong start to get the win. Leeds 3, Portsmouth 3 was just... I mean, this is the championship manifest, <laughs> isn't it? Yes. How, do you, how would you sum that up in uh, 90 seconds? Leeds started incredibly strongly and hit the, hit the crossbar three times in the opening exchanges and looked like they were going to wipe the floor with Pompey. Mm. Um, is how it started. Three off the bar and at then, nil nil. <laughs> and then it turned massively. Um, well, they, they they went ahead through a, a Pascal strike um, penalty, and then um, and it kind of felt like that was going to be the start of quite a difficult first day back in the the second tier for for Pompey. But Sorensen scored after twenty three minutes. Um, I think Elam Melier is to blame for that goal. Um, oh, I would say Jaden Bogle. I'd say both. <laughs> um, kind of went through Melier, uh, but you are right, Bogle gave gave Sorensen the, the space in which to, to get into the position to do so. Nothing you can do about Callum Lang's goal to make it 2-1. It was an unbelievable strike. Um, just one of those we have to hold your hands up and say sometimes a player is going to do that from 25 yards. Brilliant from Lang. Um, a player who I think will be important for Pompey uh, this season who's got off to a very good start. Um, Monto scored straight from basically kickoff for the second half, a goal that he couldn't have scored last season because mm. Crescencio Somerville played in that role. But that is nominally where he's played the best of his football in his career off the left hand side, and he should be able to consistently, you would think, turn the the right back inside onto his right foot and fire across the keeper, which is what he did here. Um, only for you know Leeds kind of knocking on the door throughout, and it felt like they were the team who were going to get the winner if it came. We thought it came through a. Um, penalty for Pompey dispatched by Lang I don't think it was a penalty I definitely agree that Bogle has his arm around Sadie but Sadie does that thing before Bogle does anything mm. where he makes contact with Bogle and he just holds his shirt mm. behind his back and all you're doing then is a as a striker is you're saying I'm not going to let you go anywhere here yeah. and then you're going to foul me and I'm going to go down and yeah. I think if the first contact is you basically attaching yourself to the defender mm. then I think it becomes very difficult for them to actually genuinely foul you unless it's a swiping your legs personally yeah. but I can see why it was given I think it's a contentious decision rather than a bad one mm. um, and Lang dispatched the penalty only for Aronson making his first start for Leeds in, in over a season having spent last season out on loan um, with a nice finish albeit he should have made it 4-3 and he missed a much easier chance right at the death 
basically a penalty in open play, which he skewed wide of the left-hand post. An unbelievable game, impossible to round up in, in 90 minutes. A game where... 90 minutes? Sorry, 90 seconds. Wow. Whole yeah, pod on it. 97 minutes. <laughs> uh, I, you know, someone who fancies Leeds to kind of wipe the floor this season, I didn't see anything that concerns me too much within the game itself. Um, but, but, you know, great for Pompey and their fans to have uh, gone to Ellen Road and taken a point, albeit so close to three. So close to three was Bristol City, were Bristol City, away at Hull, um, into injury time, one up through Fali Mayulu, Mayulu on his debut, uh, who I wrote about on our transfer coverage on NTT20.com, um, a 21-year-old, six-foot-four striker with speed, the ability to shoot powerfully with both feet, um, someone whose uh, breakdown of, of goals by body part is 11 with his right foot, now 11 with his left foot and five with his head, which is like my absolute wet dream. Um, and he'd put them ahead and they deserved to be ahead. And Hull was shooting themselves in the foot a bit um, by giving the ball away at the back, which is what led to the goal. And then Williams with a really wild challenge inside the uh, Bristol City box, giving away a pen scored by Estupinian, who is back from his uh, year-long holiday away from Hull and actually had quite a few chances to, to score earlier in the game. Um, a one-all draw, and uh, from this game came one of my favourite Sunday scouting reports uh, on Twitter on Sunday from an account called Hull is Massive. And it <laughs> said, Liam Miller is a baller. Armstrong for City, uh, sorry, Sinclair Armstrong for Bristol City may be the strongest man to ever grace the planet. <laughs> Just on that, there was a weird um, passes quirk where my in my mind... <laughs> oh, if there's anything you like more than a passes quirk... I'm yet to see it. <laughs> in my mind, I thought this was going to be Hull dominate the ball with a relatively high line and Bristol City look and try and pound the play in transition. Like the opposite. 252 of, of uh, Hull's 343 passes were in their own half. Wow. Which is very Rossini-y. Mm. Do you reckon Ashroom was sitting at home falling asleep? Yep. And of Bristol City's 283 passes, 213 were in the oppo half. So they were basically knocking it around, pinning, pinning Hull, which maybe due to their um, struggles to break down a low block, was deliberate from Tim Walter, albeit not very heart attack. And it should be said that Bristol City still at their best in transition, I would say, rather mm. than when they were camped. So just just weird. Interested to see how both teams develop stylistically from here. Yeah, in League One across the 12 games, only one draw. So tons of significant results. Uh, I would like to start at London Road, where Huddersfield, down from the Championship, beat Peterborough, uh, losing playoff team the last two seasons at this level by two goals to nil and it was two 20 yarders from their two number eights uh, Anthony Evans with the first Ben Wiles with the second brilliant opening day result for Michael Duff and for Huddersfield I think the most impressive thing was that they kept Peterborough to just four shots in the second half when they were two nil up I think that is an excellent sign that the sorts of things that we rate Michael Duff very highly for are being implemented at Huddersfield, which obviously didn't quite happen at Swansea. But um, he's back, and the back three of, of Helic in the middle, Lees and Spencer on the outside of him, with Hogg sitting in front of them as a single pivot, with Wiles and Evans um, sort of box to boxing. It looks nice, it feels nice. It's just the top of the pitch, really, that looks still a bit awkward on paper for Huddersfield, I would suggest. Uh, Healy and Karoma started up top, um, <clears throat> and I just think in terms of like, the alchemy of what you'd want from a front two and, and what I perceive Duff wants from a front two. I think you, you probably want a little more physicality. Now, that is in the squad in the form of Danny Ward, but uh, physically he has found it pretty difficult over the last few years to sustain it. You know, his, his, it's a struggle to stay fit and stay available and, and play 90 minutes. So I think there's probably more to be done here for Huddersfield, but an absolutely excellent start to the season for them winning away at Peterborough. The other two goal winners... We're also a newbie to the league, but they've come up from League Two. They're Stockport County. They beat Cambridge by two goals to nil. And Louis Barry mm. announcing himself or re-announcing himself uh, to Stockport fans. Always trust a man with two first names. Never. Never. Um, but, yeah, what a way to, to kind of uh, come back to Stockport. Obviously, such an important player for the, for the beginning of the last campaign, came back late on. The, the you know the loan back for this season it was only secured just on the on the eve of the season but Louis Barry after how long was it five minutes um, you said big... a very excited WhatsApp message after this one yeah oh my god Louis Barry <laughs> um, Corey Adai 
Route one, yeah. Carl Witten uh, absolutely bullying Rossi for the header. And then first time, I mean, it's not even the distance out from Barry. It's like, what, 25 yards? Yeah. It's more, it's more just the height. Moonball. He just decides he's going to lob, um, he's going to lob Reyes. But rather than just kind of putting it just above Reyes' head, he just kicks it miles up in the air. <laughs> yeah. And so it's, precise. It's aesthetically a, a wondrous goal and a player that I just love so much. And I'm really happy that he's doing it in League One for Stockport. Um, and they were really good throughout. Cambridge had a couple of opportunities that they weren't able to to put away. Um, a great bit of defending from Horsfall to stop uh, Kai Kai at 1-0, which was important uh, before Witten got the second goal to, for a, a pretty regulation 2-0 win. Uh, Cambridge will have much easier days coming, and I still think Stockport might be the team that have been slept on the most because I think they could be a massive force in this league. Lovely assist from Jaden Fevrier. Yes, I meant to say that. It was well, good. For every reason. Is, this is where when you fall down, I pick you up and vice yeah. versa. This is the podcasting equivalent of a trust fall. I wrote I've caught you. Fevrier Stockpot and Adai saves. Yeah, a classic Alec typo in there as well. Yeah. Uh, love to see it. Yeah, um, two dummy crosses from Fevrier, which uh, I think his ratio of dummy crosses to crosses is about two dummy crosses for every one cross, yeah. um, as was the case here. But when it came, it was so good. And when you're able to put in crosses like that with your weaker foot, a little bit like Fellows earlier, who plays in the same position, it's just such a skill, it's such a strength, makes you so hard to defend. Um, I'm not sure Fevrier's shooting with his left foot is actually that strong a part of his game. So, you know, even though it sounds weird, I would probably prefer him going down the outside and getting balls across the box or hanging them up. And Wooten... I think, you know, if people have slept on Stockport, I think even within Stockport County, I think people sleep a bit on Kyle Wooten, mainly because he's been injured for for big chunks of the last two seasons. But as a target man, as we saw for Barry's opening goal, as we saw for him heading home February's cross, I really do think in, in well, certainly at League Two level and now potentially at League One level, he is really, really strong in, in that position. And there's a lot to be said for having a player like that if you have great wingers like Barry and Fevrier, if you have someone like Collar um, staying close in a kind of number 10 role as well. Really impressed with Wooten. And I, and I think, you know, Alafe scored the goals last season. They signed Michael Mellon, who we remember scoring goals mm. last season. But I, I think Wooten, you know, do not sleep on his quality as a target man. Doing a lot of sleeping, aren't we, around Stockport <laughs> yeah, tonight? Yeah, for sure. Uh, loads of away wins now um, to tell you about. Leighton Orient 1, Bolton 2. Good start to the season results-wise for Bolton. Good start to the season performance-wise for Leighton Orient, I'd say. Uh, they played really well here. And it was pretty much... You don't like to boil a game down. Taylor two keepers. Taylor, Taylor two keepers. Taylor two keepers. Taylor two keepers. Um, Baxter, amazing save. Well, two good ones. One good one, one amazing one. His battle against Charlie Kelman was a, a big part of this game. Kelman scoring one, but Baxter thwarting him with some great glovemanship in the second half. Um, and at the other end, unfortunately, Zach Hemming, who was on loan from Borough, trying to fill the gloves of Sol Brin, who was on loan from Borough last season, didn't have a great game. Uh, it was a precise finish from Dion Charles, kind of one of those fairly like slow, low, bubbly it's Such shots. a weird one where like... You're like, oh, what a finish. But actually, it's just a bit of a hit and hope, and it just, yeah. it just creeps in the near corner. It could go anywhere. And then I've dropped my pen, um, which is apt because uh, Hemming dropped across for Bolton's <laughs> second goal, which was scored, finished nicely by Adeboyejo. Um So, yeah, I kind of come out of this quite pro late in Orient, to be honest. Um, and also excited about the fact that Zach Obiero started in midfield for them. Uh, he's a, a young central midfielder that started the last few games of last season and, and Wellens is, is clearly going to take a lot of time and effort into developing him further. Wellens was obviously a, a central midfielder himself, which I guess will help uh, Obiero, particularly when it comes to the technical side of the game. Looks like he's got a lot of interesting attributes and I think the scouts will be flocking to uh, Brisbane Road to watch this kid. I uh, had a, a few mentions of him from, from Bolton fans as well in the Sunday scouting reports. Another 2-1 away win. I was going to say quite like the look of Sean. The Bolton left wing back. Yeah. Hungarian. Did he play well? He played well. He shone. He shone. Mm. He shone, yes, in East London. <laughs> as a, as, George, just as a Hungarian that lives in East London, you know, I think I need to look out for him. Nice. Because he was doing it around the corner from me. Right. Well, now you've got to spend every other week travelling up to the northwest to watch him play home games. That's just he, irrelevant. Though. He won't be playing in, in <laughs> East London anytime soon. Um, Barnsley won Mansfield too. Friday night fun for the Stags. 
Yeah, and they were good for the most part. I mean, they, they opened the scoring fairly early with a, a brilliant strike from Stephen Quinn um, and then doubled their lead with, with Lee Gregory uh, shortly after that. As you would kind of expect, uh, well, as you would expect, Barnsley came came back at them, uh, Connell with a deflected effort um, to make it 2-1. Um, and there were lots of, you know, they had to withstand some pressure, Mansfield, but did so relatively com- comfortably um, I think for Daryl Clark it'll be a massive frustration that his first game in charge of Barnsley home against a, new- a newly promoted side um, an opportunity you'd think in order to-, to get an early three points on the board but not to do so and to, you know on a Friday night where all eyes were on them but I do think Mansfield are a side you know they were according to the underlying numbers they were the best team in League 2 last season um, they've basically kept hold of most of their players in Nigel Clough they've got a very very solid manager so uh, yeah I mean frustration from the home team but Mansfield are not a bad side and I think could upset a few teams this season so um, Barnsley did have after going 2-0 down 20 of the next 22 shots yeah exactly um, to be expected and also yeah. interesting to note that Davis Keeler Dunn has been linked to a move to Barnsley who I think would be a, a pretty good replacement for McAtee from last season um, who's going to who's gone to Bolton uh, and Keeler Dunn played 90 minutes here which yeah. is quite a fun quirk if he does go there and Mansfield have kept the majority of stag attendees from last season but they have added a player in Keanu Bacchus who we need to talk about who got an assist for Gregory's goal uh, he comes very highly commended from all who watched him north of the border uh, especially our Scottish mole who's a big fan of his um, and had a good debut and I think what's also important is that we celebrate uh, anyone playing in the EFL whose first name is Keanu, because I think yeah. we we all love the Keanus, but maybe a I'm little not less. A fan of Keanu Reeves. You don't like him? Well, I just only because I don't really like the Matrix. Right. As a as a bloke, it seems lovely. Well, famously, like one of the greats. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Yeah, but I just don't like the Matrix. I've never seen it. Well, there you go. <laughs> I mean, it's very popular, so we're probably upsetting a few people now it's just yeah. not for me. I'm not a big sci-fi guy Mansfield spent most of this game dodging bullets yes yeah. you like that's that? good yeah. but um, I would like to talk about his surname actually because this is the most perfect meeting of uh, player and team because Bacchus uh, you guys will know is the Roman god of agriculture wine and fertility and he was often seen with vines of grapes with him big big drinker big wine guy um, obviously, the the adjective bacchanalian is or means characterised by or given to drunken revelry. Mm. So for him to join the stag party is just perfect. Did you see the the controversy about the Bacchus statue recently? No, what happened? Just some people were imitating some acts with it, ah. and people got upset. And people made the point: this is exactly what Bacchus would want. Yeah. Let him do it. He'd have loved that. Yeah, for sure. And he probably would have loved being in the Mansfield away end as they got. Away end as they got off to a winning start. Uh, same happened at Burton for the Lincoln fans. Those imps in the away end. A 3-2 win, a late winner as well. Um, cracking game this. I think we can expect Burton games to have five goals in them yep. as standard because they, as we thought they would, attacked with reckless abandon, lots of excitement, created a fair few chances, to be fair, and scored two goals, but also conceded three-headed goals. And I'll be honest, there's one big concern about the uh, stylistic change of Burton Albion under the manager, Mark Robinson, based on his Wimbledon side from a couple of years ago. It would be, don't forget to defend, lads. Mm. And don't forget that defending your box is really important because you will come up against Paulie O'Connor and people of his ilk, and they will score two headers against you if you don't bother defending your box. So Lincoln with the win, great assists from Rowan. Bayless. And Bayless. Double assist. Lovely assist also from uh, young Burton player Kieran Gilligan, mm. one of the few sort of that's actually um, stuck around from last season's squad. He's a, an academy graduate as well, and clearly Robinson, a big fan of his. Really nice assist. Uh, the other notable player for me was Lincoln goalkeeper Wickens. He is massive. He's a big man. And he, in the build-up to the uh, second goal, he took a goal kick that uh, the first contact when the ball dropped was like two yards outside the box at the other end of the pitch. Mm. That's a bit of me, that. Yeah. That is a bit of me. Uh, and he made a couple of big saves as well. Wigan nil, Charlton won. Charlton won this one, 1-0. One Charlton did win it 1-0. I wouldn't say from an attacking point of view there was loads to get excited about for Charlton. They only mustered four shots within the game. Um, Wigan, 
were probably the better team. Uh, they certainly looked after the ball better for the most part. Uh, Charlton went relatively direct, but I think if you're a Charlton fan and you go to Wigan on opening day and you win the game 1-0, you're leaving happy basically regardless of the actual performance yeah. within it, especially after what they had to deal with last season. I think this is probably a game where there'll be frustration from Wigan that they weren't able to, to get something out of the game, but they'll leave with a lot of positives um, within it. Um, so, yeah, I mean, frustration for them, but... Um, you know, I, I wouldn't be overly concerned if I was a Wigan fan at, at this stage. Wrexham beat Wickham 3-2. It's one game. Sorry. <laughs> Wrexham beat Wickham 3-2, um, playing like Ooh. an all-star team. The second goal, just every single bit of it is just... Mm. Yeah, the, the YouTube... Um, the YouTube. The YouTube title for the Stockport game is... Louis Barry with goal of the season contender. It's not even goal of the day. <laughs> Jack Marriott's goal is goal of the day without question. Mm. Um, what just, did you like about it? I liked the touch. I like the ball into Palmer. I like the touch from Palmer. I like the touch from Marriott. And I like the way that he hits with the outside of his boot into the top left hand corner. All of it. It is sensational. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, massive. Well, just an awesome goal. I loved it. Um, I kind of liked how the third goal was sort of like a light version played along the ground of that goal. It was well, Dobson into Dolby into Lee, but then and then like, his shot was saved and Fletcher yeah, finished a the rebound. There's kind of a couple of ricochets in there that don't make it quite as pleasing. But as someone who sat here eight days ago, nine I love days how ago... we're referencing how often we sit here. ...and said, ah, Wrexham you know, might need to develop that style of play a little bit. Well, they're playing like Brazil 1970 here. Uh, yes. In, albeit, the, in those two instances. You know, 189 completed passes for, with a 61 pass ah, completion rate. Right. So it's not all sex. Interesting. <laughs> Very little, in fact. <laughs> yeah. So I do want to point out Max Cleworth. Who... That's what I was going to say. Okay, go on. Well, I just like the fact that a guy who's been around at Wrexham for a while in amongst all the chaos is still playing centre back for them in League One and scoring their opening goal. Yeah. Been there since he was 12. Yeah. 22 year old, became a starter halfway through last season. Nice little sort of right centre back in a three profile, I would suggest, both in and indeed out of possession. Uh, and Richard Kone, looking bright again. Nice finish one again. terrible finish. Then one very nice finish. Yeah, 50%. Well, it's like a one-on-one -on -one where he put out for a throw, which is fun. <laughs> Don't worry um, about that. But no, Stepped up from the eighth tier in January. Got well, a couple a, of goals towards the end of last season and an opening day one here. And a big pre-season guy as well, where apparently he's been looking he? very sharp, wow. according to Wickham fans. Um, but yeah, he got the, the, the goal to, to get them back in it. Vokes with a, a late one as well off the bench. Um... Uh, Udo came off the bench as well, so they've got some attacking options now. And, and you know, for the again, two 0 down after twenty nine minutes um, is going to play a big part in this. But they had nineteen shots, expected goals of two point one two, like some signs there that they're going to be okay from an attacking uh, uh, perspective. So a bit like how Wrexham started last season as well. So sort of quite a lot of carnage, quite a lot of chaos. Five three in that one, wasn't it? Probably used quite a lot of this footage for the dock, and then sort of from October onwards, when the when the nights are getting longer, Maybe Parkinson's grinding. like right. Enough of that. Yeah. Let's let's hit the channels, lads. Come on. None of that Brazil 1970 Fun. stuff. Uh, Crawley beat Blackpool 2-1. Welcome back to League One. At Crawley Town, your manager is a legend. Um, your striker, Hepburn Murphy, has scored on debut. Really cute assist from Jeremy Kelly. Kelly was the guy that they plucked from, like, the second or third tier of uh, US football in January... Uh, with an incredible backstory. I think he was born in Czech Republic, maybe grew up in France, been out in <laughs> America, and now he lives near Gatwick, and he's balling out for Crawley. He played left wing back at the end of last season. Yep. Now he's playing 10. Ten. <laughs> they had seven played, debuts. Played right back and centre back in America. Like Does, it, does he play every position? <laughs> Such a fun ball through to Heaven Murphy for the first ball. ball. The first goal, mad. Quitino with a bit of fortune for his own debut goal. Seven debuts in total. Um, but picking up where they left off by beating Blackpool. Scott Malone, Do you, yeah. the most left-backy of left-backs that the EFL has seen in the last decade. Yeah. Right wing back. Why not? Inverted. Yeah. Scott Lindsay, the, the number one let him cook manager well, he, in the EFL. I don't want to upset Crawley fans, but I said Here in our pre-season content that I would be amazed if he was still there at the end of the season. Scott Lindsay or Scott Malone? Scott Lindsay. <laughs> And if Preston North End genu genuinely want to go after someone who can take groups of players with not much time and turn them into much more than the, than the sum of their parts whilst playing really fun attacking football, well, I'm telling you where Stop to go. Stop it. 
Yeah. Stop it. Uh, for Blackpool, this is one of them where ordinarily I'd be like, look, they created loads of chances. They got caught cold a little bit in the first half. Unfortunate with the second goal being deflected um, and, you know, trust the process type stuff. But unfortunately, their away record was so poor last season. This exact match happened like 20 times last season. And the travelling Blackpool fans are, are, are getting pretty mutinous, basically, to the point where I think, like... Even if they win at home to Stockport on Saturday, the most important game for them is away at Cambridge on the 24th, where, like, it's just Groundhog Day for them at the moment. And because Critchley is not the most engaging personality, I think it exacerbates the football being boring and the results not being as good as they would like. And I'm I'm sensing a bit of impending doom there um, at Blackpool, which makes me sad. Me too. See how we go. Uh, Bristol Rovers won Northampton nil. Another team with a lot of debutants in the starting eleven. Uh, Bristol Rovers six in total. One of them getting the winner in injury time. I think this is a big result for Matt Taylor, George. Something that can act as a, a binding agent for this manager, this fan base, this team. The Belongo binder. Yeah. Um they were pretty good, I thought. This was, I mean, even though it took them until the 92nd minute to win it, it was a relatively comfortable home performance, really, where they made they were the better team. They prevented Northampton from creating much of any um, significant uh, significance mm. in terms of, of kind of big chances and good chances. Um, they will feel like they had opportunities to take the lead before they took it. It came through a set piece with Belongo um, heading home in front of their, their home fans. It's the kind of um, catalytic. Uh, way of winning that can have a massive impact where the fans you know staring down the barrel of a frustrating nil nil draw in a game they should have won suddenly go home happy having won one nil with a new signing kind of making a name for himself too so yeah I think it's um, plenty to like Omicheri looked pretty lively up top Hutchinson had a decent opportunity that was blocked Thomas on the right hand side was really good mm. uh, he got the assist as well so a, a really good first day at the office for uh, Bristol Rovers um, Hoskins went kind of close-ish to equalising in the like, 97th minute, just curling one over the bar. Um, but Northampton been pretty toothless for the most part. Uh, I'm sure we'll see them improve in, in the next couple of weeks. Same scoreline. Similar vibe. Exeter 1, Rotherham 0. Um, more more Larry, I think, wasn't it? A bit more Larry. Vibe-wise. bit more Larry. Yeah. Evan said really nice things about Exeter and Caldwell pre-game. Yeah. And I don't know what happened to that, but uh, by full time. He feels it. Doesn't he? Well, you know when you know when you know that feeling when you see red. No, I'm. Uh, You've never seen red. No. I think Chilled. when I think when Steve sees red, it's like crimson. It is. You just can't. Well, he won't rack. be shaking. He, he certainly doesn't like shaking hands after a defeat. Um, and a poor performance from Rotherham, but <laughs> quite a positive one for for Exeter, who had nice debuts from Ed Francis in midfield, stepping up from the National League and looking very tidy. Uh, John Lee Yefeko. It's my favourite first name I've ever heard. John Lee. Well, it's the kind of thing that if I had a friend called John, I'd call him that as like a as like a nickname. John Lee. Like we call Jed Wallace Jedley. Yes. Well, John I, Lee... I even called Des Buckingham Desley. <laughs> he... And now there's a guy who actually exists called John Lee. <laughs> <laughs> he set up um, Caleb Watts for the winner. They've been the better side all game, basically. An excellent extra performance. Uh, but Jack McMillan and Tristan Kramer also performed well. Yeah. So pretty positive extra City opening day performance. thought they were really good. Um... Yeah, I think Afeko was was the one, you know, making his. I think it's a senior debut. I don't think he actually played for Rangers, did he? Um, so in his first loan to put in a performance like that and get an assist was was incredibly impressive. You know, with, with them, we kind of said before the season started, it was so much dependent on how good the loans were, and we we didn't know that. Uh, yeah. And first evidence is pretty good. Uh, Rotherham were as we'd expect them to be, um, really direct, kind of bypassing midfield um, with both Hugo and Clark Harris starting up top. So for, for Exeter to basically keep a clean sheet and do so relatively com- com- comfortably, there were a couple of um, moments of pinball as um, the, the aerial bombardment ramped up by, by Rotherham, but they were, you know, they were good value for their win, I would say. Yeah. Um, it is, is m- mightily impressive because you think of this Exeter side and the way they like to play and the, the youthfulness of the team up against the the uh, the bullies, I guess, of, of Rotherham and, and, you know, we where they are very aware of the way they play and, and how they're going to look to get an advantage. I think this is one of the most impressive wins, I would say, of, of opening day across the three leagues. Mm. Yeah, and a disappointing opening day for Rotherham, mm. fancied by many pre-season and I think be poor, right. 
four. Bristol Rovers at home next Saturday. One to watch. Stevenage one, Shrewsbury nil. Another comfortable one nil home win. Stevenage uh, making the running better side, huffing and puffing just a little bit before Elliot List got on the ball, grabbed the shrews by the horns, <laughs> and uh, won the game for them. Uh, his first goal since Boxing Day. Um, Shrews created one early chance through Bloxham, but other than that, very, very little. One very exciting moment from Tommy O'Reilly, uh, the Villa Loney, whose nickname in Villa circles was Little Foden or Baby Foden or Mini Foden, did one like very Foden-esque, received the ball in midfield, spin away from two, and lay it off to Benning, running onto it, sliced it high and wide. So... Uh, one to watch O'Reilly, but otherwise just a pretty below par display from Shrews to to start the campaign. But a great start for Alex Ravel and Stevenage. And Birmingham won, Reading won. Was the only draw in League One. A team that have spent over ten million quid <coughs> against the only team in the EFL that haven't signed a single player. <laughs> and the story wasn't the money bags league favourites. It was the performance of Ruben Celes's Reading. They were so good. Um, I, I couldn't watch the whole game, but I watched the first half an hour or so and, and Reading were, were, were so impressive. And when the alert came on my phone that they'd taken the lead um, through Herr Batterman, um, it was no surprise whatsoever because I think they deserved it at that point. Um, they, you know, often when you, we've been excited to see a team for the first time, well, you know, whether it's Burnley two seasons ago, I know in Championship, Leeds, Bielsa and Leeds, McKenna's Ipswich, the season before they came second where we knew they were building towards something you can really see it and with Birmingham I, I didn't really see it like we'd heard a lot in pre-season about how good the football had been and how crisp their passing was and the movement and the patterns of play I, I've got a feeling we may see it soon I think this is just a Reading side whose press is so effective mm. and so good that they kind of struggled to, to implement their style of play whatsoever on the game um, uh, for anyone who read Luanza's piece, wouldn't have been surprised to see a, a tidy finish from um, from the Reading youngster who I'm excited to see. It looks like he's going to play. It kind of feels like the way they set up on Saturday was Smith and Camera kind of playing as two tens with 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 uh, Bishman far, further forward. Which sorry, he's almost got like a Hadji Wright esque role where he's sort of off the, left, off the left, but like a goal scorer. Yeah, but the kind of the key goal scoring threat it seems mm. to me. Um, so. I'm 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 excited by them. Like, still, let's see what happens with the, with the takeover. I mean, again, sorry to Reading fans. Like, Sellers has to be really appealing to a side like Preston again. Like, someone who is doing incredible work in ridiculous circumstances at Reading, where mm. it doesn't matter how many players seem to leave or how many youth team players he, he has to blood, he's still capable of creating a side who are able to to kind of put in performances like this. If you date back to if you take the, the League One table from February the 1st and you include um, Saturday's games or the weekend's games, Reading a sixth, mm. like even despite the fact that things kind of spiralled in January for them. So he's doing amazing work. Birmingham came back into it in the second half. Um, they won a penalty uh, with kind of five minutes to go, which Alfie made dispatch. So he's off the mark. Do they deserve it? maybe in terms of the, the way they ratcheted up the pressure in the second half, but I think Reading can feel pretty hard done by they didn't get what would have been an incredible opening day victory. The youngest player that played in the EFL over the weekend came off the bench for Reading, Andre Garcia, 16 years old. Uh, fun story in that you can find out very little about this player on the internet. Uh, Ruben Sellers watched him play in a training game. Uh, he's a left back, I believe, by trade. And Sellers saw him play, was like, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, he can help my first team. And played him right wing when he came off the bench yep. and looked... Played well. Don't want to don't want to be piling any pressure on, but played well. Uh, as did Ben Elliott, by the way. He was the one picked out by almost everyone watching this game, uh, having been absolutely excellent. Uh, someone with pretty serious Chelsea youth team pedigree, Elliott, um, who's, what is he, uh, 21? And um, I think it's time. I think it's time for Ben Elliott to, to come to the party, and I think that he can and, and will. Oh, welcome to the EFL, Bromley. Oh. And you are more than welcome if you're going to be playing like this. They went to Harrogate, they won 2 0, and we're not like big scoreline guys. We are like um, shop map guys. We are uh, underlying numbers guys. I'm kind of looking at their shop map. We are, let's try and measure performance outside of scoreline and see if it looks any different. And I think, George, that if you do that, 
the most impressive performance and win of the League Two weekend was Bromley at Harrogate. Yeah, I'm, I'm totally in agreement. Um, That's good. It took them until the hour mark to get off the mark and it was apt that it was Cheek, um, who's been the hero for them in non-league, who was able to get the goal. Um, but it had been coming. They were the better team throughout. Um, I was driving back from the Oxford game and uh, BBC Radio 5 Live had a reporter at this game, the only League 2 game they had a reporter at. And throughout the first half, he was saying, probably just by far the better team here. Like It feels like a matter of time until they score. And watching it back, it tallies. It was as we expected from Andy Woodman's side. It was pretty direct. It was um, looking to crowd the box at every opportunity when they could do um, with their aerial prowess. But they were able to to do that and created by far the better opportun- opportunities. They were they were solid defensively from set pieces and uh, in open play. Harrogate have, have long been my kind of biggest confusion in uh, League Two, where they are capable of being incredibly good, but also capable of being very poor. And this felt to me like a really poor iteration of Harrogate, and it felt to me like they really lacked the individual sparkle of, of Ibiodo, who mm. sort of, of course moves on to Peterborough and didn't even go off the bench on Saturday. So, you know, there, there is a caveat to that, as there is for most dominant wins on opening day. You, you just don't know what you've played, but for the most part, uh, all evidence that I saw on Saturday suggesting that Bromley will be absolutely fine for this level. Yeah, Cheek with his chest. Mm. I think you you know, like you hear about guys like Cheek who score 155 National League goals in nine seasons. Yeah. And you're like, will we ever get to see them at a level above? Or is there some sort of personal reason why they're just happy plugging away in the National League? And you think he must have a knack for goal scoring. And there's something about diving onto a kind of cross cum shot to chest it in. Mm. Just throwing your body at it. Yeah. Which it's is just very like, it's, ice score. It's, just... it's very ice score goals. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Yes. It's like, and at the other end, you get uh, Jake Bidwell made an amazing block in the Stoke Cov game where like a shot comes in and he genuinely throws his whole body at the ball. Yeah. And it's like, yeah, that's a defender. Yeah. Um, Cheek did the, the, the goal scoring equivalent of that. Uh, his first football league goal and uh, Millwall loney Kamal Grant with the second from a set piece. I just loved Woodman's post-match where like he was... It was like he'd been challenged by his mates beforehand. You know how, like, one time my mates challenged me to say um, the word bears yeah, yeah. on Sky on a Friday night. I remember it well. And I managed to sneak it in. Is that the first thing that you've admitted to that publicly? Pressing like a pack of bears, I said. Yeah. And they all went nuts. And there's a video of it, isn't there? Yeah. There's a good video of it. Um, it was like... <laughs> I've forgotten what I was going to say. It was like someone had said to Andy Woodman, even though... Your team's just won really comfortably 2-0 away from home in their first ever EFL game. Try to act as if you're not happy at all and uh, you don't want to give any praise. He was like, the handbrake is so on. We've done nothing. This means nothing. Yeah. Unless we back it up. Like, it was just what I expected. He's not wrong, is he? But that not that quite exciting? 45 more games. Isn't that quite exciting? Yeah. He's not starry-eyed. No. He's, in fact, laser-focused. Mm. Laser eye surgery, if anything. Um, Donny Forak not needed because he's already got great vision talking of lasers yeah Luke Molyneux's left foot yes 4-1 to Donny against Accrington 4-1 to Donny and Molyneux the star um, the second goal of his was just one of those times where a player hits the ball from 30 yards and it just flies really fast in the top corner had a really nice the way that it hit the net and just dropped mm. was also um, very must good feel he, so good. He also hit the bar with another really nice strike from the right-hand side as well. Um, yeah. So and scored the first. And scored the first with a nice finish. How many goals do you think him and Jordan Gibson will score between them this season? Because if they get a good run together as Donny's wide forwards... 21. Really? I think... I mean, they're already on three. 27. Okay. We'll come back to that. I mean, Gibson looks like... How a, many goals is Billy Sharp going to score for Doncaster this season? Uh, Cause, 16. Because he's on one. Wow, that'd be good. All comps. Yeah, or, or just league. Um, I doubt we'll play in the cups. <laughs> yeah, league. That's that would be good, wouldn't it? Yeah, he's, well, he scores goals. I mean, he <laughs> scored a goal here. His fourth debut for Donny. So good. His fourth debut goal. Isn't that great? That's unbelievable. And, and hadn't played for them since 2014. Ten years since the last time he pulled on a Doncaster shirt. They hadn't played in League Two since the 0405 season. The Incredible. second half of that. So almost 20 years since his last yeah. League Two goal. And it was he was standing in the box. The cross came in, and he wrapped his foot around it and put it in the goal. Does he look in, like, pretty good shape? 
Like for a thirty-eight year old, fit as a fiddle. Well, he's, yeah, not. I'd enough. go as far as saying. Yeah, he looks good. He looks good. Second oldest player in League Two over the weekend, with the oldest being his teammate Richard Wood. But there, there has to be a chance with him, and we, me and you spoke about it off camera before the season started. Where like, if he's playing for a Donny side, who have massive goal scoring and creative threats in wide areas, who are going to dominate the ball for the most part, and he doesn't have to do much in terms of pressing the centre backs or, you know, basically running. He could be phenomenally good. Like we've seen older players, older strikers whose legs have effectively gone, score a lot of goals in the past because you just don't lose the ability to take up positions in the box, to anticipate where balls are going to go and to finish. You do. At like 45, he won't have that. I mean, you say that. Well, why does no one play till 45 we've never seen then, it it apart hurt. from that Japanese striker? Because it, it hurts. Because it hurts. It hurts in the morning. Right, okay. Ask Billy how he was on Sunday morning. <laughs> um, Aki, mm, they've played a good team here, so let's not judge too hard. But three shots in total, only one of them inside the box. It was a nice goal, in fairness. Uh, Wally with the cross for Tyler Walton, his first EFL goal, 25-year-old that they signed from Southport. It's a fifth player signed by Accrington from Southport in the last 10 years. Uh, quite a, uh, a fertile... Uh, transfer flow that one um, Dion Charles probably the, the, the name for Walton to emulate and he's made a good start but Aki haven't uh, Jill's four Carlisle one same scoreline mad result my, sorry, mad, mad game mad game I want to start by shouting out Robert Jill's fan on the squad good stat first and foremost first time we've scored four in a game in 186 games my god good start for Mark Bonner on that front but Robert, and another Jills fan who tweeted a Sunday scouting report. Really good, solid Jills fans, these. Both saying, probably flattered us a bit, actually, the 4-1 scoreline. Well, Carlisle had 18 shots, an XG of 1.93 compared to the 14 shots of Gilliam and 1.05 XG. Now, obviously, those don't tell the full story, but it would mm. suggest that um, you know the flattery of a 4-1 scoreline to the home team uh, looks justified, given that you know Carlisle were able to create a fair few chances Medish with the goal for them I thought the best goal was Nolan's finish for Gillingham the third goal um, scoring a goal on, on Davy for them although Johnny Williams' strike late on as well was also a, a good one so four very good goals good to see Jacob Wakeling off the off the mark early on in his Gillingham career but players had quite a funny EFL career so far mm-hmm. when Swindon had like quite a good first season played like over 40 games playing up front scored like single figure goals and that led to a move to Peterborough which seemed way too much too early mm. barely played unsurprisingly last season but now back at well back in League 2 and should be in a conducive environment for his own development yeah so nice take that was delighted for Mark Bonner didn't help themselves Carlisle the old Terrell Thomas through ball for Wakeling yeah and the old Harry Lewis dropping a, a high ball yes for one of the other goals mm. um, undermining what was I think an okay performance and you wonder if and this might be stretching maybe confidence still a bit low because you play well you're actually looking relatively bright two mistakes punished by both and then kind of losing your confidence a bit and, and petering out a little bit um, great result for Carlisle great result for uh, sorry great result for Gillingham very bad result for Carlisle but yeah. Just keep an eye on those performances. Not too bad. Tough games. They've got Barrow and MK next. So you'd think they need to... All tough games at this level, mate. Nope. After that, they've got Tranmere at home. That's a joke. <laughs> That's a joke. Uh, Vale came down with Carlisle and they got off to a better start. A tuna win at Salford. I think this was the game across the three leagues with the least amount of open play yeah. action. Both goals from set pieces. Both goals sniffed out by Ben Garrity. Vale captain... Um, they looked organised and solid. Um, still quite a lot to work out, I think, at the top end of the pitch. But Garrity sort of winning them the game. They look a massive threat from set pieces um, with their monstrous centre-backs uh, trotting forward each time. But Garrity benefiting. Garrity scored 12 last time at this level. He scored 10 last season. He's pretty, like, as midfielders go at this level, he really does have the, the goal-scoring knack too already this season. Um, I had a, a, a mole who I trust at this game. <laughs> How many moles mole. do you have that you don't trust? Well, you can't trust everyone. But what, I mean, why are they your moles then? Surely just cut them loose. Well, you need... Say, I don't need your moling anymore. You need a big network of moles. You build a big network of moles and you learn over time which one, you know, the level of trust that you have. I, but, mate, in a dream world, I would trust all the moles. But do you... But what I'm saying is, do, but, you, do, you, do you maintain your relationship with the moles that you don't trust? Um, do you put them away? I'll I'll take a view on a case by case basis. Interesting. 
Because um, if I had a mole I didn't trust and I asked him his opinion and he sent it back, I'd be like, well, I don't, don't trust you. Well, the case with a lot of the moles is they send their opinion without me asking for it. Right. They see so, me so as not, sort they're of... They're not so much your mole, they're just a freelance mole, a mercenary. You know Sauron. A molesonary. You know Sauron? Yeah. Yeah, no, nothing. Um, red flags for Salford, says the mole. Yeah. Everything was launched at Cole Stockton. Didn't win much against the aforementioned Ents in the mm. back line of uh, Port Vale. Little Tolkien, two Tolkien references there for you. Cool. Um, back to back. Have you read those? Uh, no. Seen the films? Yes. Better than The Matrix? Uh, yeah, probably, but again, not a fan. Not for you. I don't like things that aren't like based in reality, although partial to a bit of Potter. <laughs> <laughs> oh, amazing. Um, yeah, Salford were bad, basically. Uh, didn't show much composure at the back, just pumped it, didn't work, played badly, lost 2-0. Things to work on. MK1, Bradford 2. Kind of wild for a few different reasons, this. Bradford were 2 yes, lap after like... 4 minutes 40. <laughs> If you're an MK fan and you've like managed to put what happened in the back end of last season, the 8-1 defeat on, in the playoffs out of your mind, and you sit down in your seat, takeover's just gone through, Mike Wally Williamson, loads of new players, and you're like, here we go, and you're 2-0 down after five minutes to one unbelievable strike and one stupid own goal. Yeah. Not ideal. No, not ideal. For, for Bradford, famously haven't added loads of new signings this summer but one player that is like a new signing Alex Patterson mm. who scored two goals when he joined at the start of last season in August and then missed the rest of the season through injury starts on opening day scores a banger and this is a guy who for Harrogate scored nine league goals in both of the last two seasons before joining Bradford handful of assists each time as well he's just he's he's a contributor he's a goals and assists guy from midfield and that's what Bradford have needed and that's what I think they seem to have added successfully goals outside of Andy Cook it's very exciting they won this game uh, they came under a lot of pressure as you'd imagine MK played some pretty good stuff um, and had quite a few chances to score a, an, an amazing Brad Halliday block a, a chance for Stephen Wynn where he like kicked it backwards that was really weird minus yardage on that shot yeah yeah not ideal also, I watched the back and it wasn't even really behind him yeah uh, just Got it wrong. kick it but sometimes you have a bad swing you know yeah. even if you're a good player uh, I'm not too worried about MK based on the performance uh, they have got new owners. Pete Winkleman uh, is no more, by which means he sold the club. <laughs> um, uh, Q8-based consortium uh, led by entrepreneurial businessman Fahad al Ghanim. They're always entrepreneurial, aren't they, these businessmen yeah. that buy football clubs? Most businessmen are. I'd like a statement that says, we've been bought by a businessman who actually doesn't show much entrepreneurial instinct, no. but has somehow still made loads which of money. Which is why he's getting involved in football. <laughs> yes. Uh, let's see how that goes. Um, I was at Plough Lane. Uh, I think I might be the goal whisperer this season. I saw nine goals in about an hour and a half. No, about two hours of football, which was quite cool. That was crazy. 32 minutes my cycle from Loftus Road to Wimbledon to get there in time for kickoff. Pretty proud of that. Sounds like you sped. Is there a speed limit for bikes? Um, you should know that. Well, I'm cycling on uh, the roads and the <laughs> lowest speed limit on the roads is 20. And albeit, I would, I would like to point out that Google Maps said it would take 44 minutes. And I got there in 32, so I was going quite quickly, but I still doubt I touched 20. But you wore your new helmet. 20's plenty. Your new helmet, which folds into a nice flat. Yep. Thing. Collapsible Coffee. helmet. I've got a collapsible coffee cup. Perfect for example, um, going to football matches and yes. not having to carry around a big helmet. And yep. Something you can fit into a rucksack. Great brand that. If anyone wants to hear more about it, please send me a tweet. <laughs> Uh, Wimbledon beat Colchester 4-2, but that does not tell the whole story because they were 2-0 down after nine minutes. Uh, ben Goodliffe on his debut for Col U, former Sutton United player, scoring two at Plough Lane, two headers. It was such a weird start. Like, the ball had barely been in play. It was 2-0 to Col U. Their fans were having the best time ever. It felt like a bad dream uh, for, for the Wimbledon fans and, and somewhat confusing. And then... So they had completed four passes, Wimbledon. Uh... <laughs> On the 12th minute, it genuinely felt like they hadn't seen the football. And then for the first time, they built an attack from the back and they scored from it. And then they scored again. And then they scored again. A 3-2 up at half time. Slightly controversial penalty, which I thought was... I was very surprised to see that handball given. Um, was, it, was he given for handball? Yeah. I mean, I thought it wasn't a penalty, but I, th I assumed it was for the push. He didn't even know what it was for. Well, I thought it was... Because you see that Stevens, like basically, like 
clattered into the advertising hoardings, and I thought it was a push from Gordon. Furlong, yeah. What? Yeah. Don't worry, I think, yeah. There was a left wing back there that's galloped in there. That's all very weird. Well, no, it's just a commentary got it wrong then. Um, uh, or, or I could have got it wrong. But yeah, I mean, I thought it was for the push. But we don't know. A penalty that I Should felt have been was controversial way. and was Neither scored. were pens. Um, but Wimbledon played really well from that point, uh, deserved their win. We talked about how the wing-backs going to be quite important <laughs> for them in terms of how good they're going to be a, in attack, and they were good. Um, Josh the Neuf. Uh, Neufville was really good, like a hot knife through butter in the build-up to the fourth goal. And Furlong on loan from Brighton was was excellent as well. Jake Reeves played really well. I love Joe Lewis and his short shorts. Um, <laughs> good performance, great win. Bit worried about Colchester, who, as you know, I was quite hot on pre-season. Welcome to the good lift. It didn't last very long, did it? No. No, it didn't. And just, uh, they've got a lot to sort out in attack. It looked really bad, I would say, in open play, in attack. What's funny is that, if, I mean, obviously a goal up within a minute changes everything, but Cowley, Jackson, two managers who I associate with being very adept at setting up teams defensively and both, you know, certainly from a set pieces from Wimbledon's point of view, but Colchester throughout after that really struggled. Yeah, I wouldn't be surprised if neither team has a game with six goals in it for I agree. until Christmas. And I wouldn't surprise me if both teams like draw nil-nil next time out purely <laughs> because they're like lads. What was that? Cheltenham three, Newport two. A lot of goals in this one too. Yes, uh, Cheltenham taking the lead. Quite fun. Both both of Cheltenham's goal, goal scorers here. Both of Cheltenham's goal scorers here mm. um, have quite fun stories. We've got uh, with a brace, uh, Joel Colwell, brother of uh, Reuben Colwell, um, on loan from Cardiff, with a really nicely taken first, uh, a sweeping finish um, after a bit of pinball in the box, uh, and then Dulson, who was brought mm. in from non-league. Uh, we, you know, we, the eighth tier he was playing in last tier, season and he just comes in and starts and scores after 27 minutes um, so a hell of a start for him and so Cheltenham's uh, new era got off to a great start but Newport pegged them back by half time with a Baker Richardson penalty and Greaves scoring to make it 2 all. seventh tier for him if you're interested yeah man 24 goals for Mikel over last season um, and it was a fairly open end to end game for the most part and but it was Cheltenham who managed to get the winner in the 96th minute Colwell that man scoring again, kind of impressed. He played 90, to be fair. Mm. Young kid making his first um, senior appearance. Um, but with a great finish, again, down the right-hand side uh, at the near post to get Cheltenham all three points. This is a, a classic case where like both teams are quite good going forward. Both teams are quite bad defensively. We think they're going to be the 24th and 22nd worst teams, uh, or sorry, best teams in the <laughs> in the league. Um, so, you know, was it just a really low quality? Are we right? Or is there room, is there reason to be positive about both we will see yeah, we had three games between teams that we had down there across the leagues uh, Watford Millwall was 3-2 yeah uh, Stephen and Shrews was 1-0 mm -hmm. and this one was 3-2 as well we'll learn more about these teams in due course but Joel Colwell a Cardiff boy beating the team that's being moulded in, in a very much a Swansea uh, style yes. under Hugh Jenkins and Nelson Jardim would have been quite sweet for him and his family and his friends no doubt Walsall beat Morecambe 1-0 uh, solid performance, great strike that won it from Taylor Allen and saw it out pretty comfortably. I think uh, a lot of the good bits of, of Walsall under Sadler on show here and also some of the stuff that makes us unclear exactly how high they can get under him. Uh, didn't exactly, didn't look that fluid at the very top of the pitch, um, but good win. I thought Connor Barrett stood out from the highlights. He's a right wing back that they signed. He played the last few years at Fylde in, in, in the National League. Him and Gordon, the wing backs, very involved for Morecambe and again like like I always say these teams in League 2 that are sort of quite beefy and quite well structured and playing 3-5-2 so much comes from the wing backs in attack mm. and if they if they play well you look good and if they don't play well you don't look good they played well Walsall looked pretty good and Barrow won Crew nil or Fleetwood won Grimsby nil whomst do you prefer there? Um, I'll take Fleetwood Grimsby just because I, I was having Although I would like to hear you talk, say nice things about Fleetwood. Um, but I'll take this. Um, Mark Helm with a really nice take and finish after 18 minutes uh, on his debut for the club. What was most impressive for me was the way that Fleetwood then defended their lead, with Grimsby having a lot of the ball, but unable to really create anything of note. Um, the biggest issue for Grimsby was their big signing. The uh, Icelandic Jason Daddy Svan Thorsen went off injured after half an hour, and that is a big blow because he 
you know, was supposedly meant to be the guy to come in to give them a, another dimension in attack. He looked very lively when he was on, had one shot from close range that was blocked. Hopefully his injury isn't too bad uh, for them. Fleetwood's still lacking a bit in attack. You know, someone who's backed them in a few markets this season, I'd like to see them add a striker because um, Coughlin and, and Lonigan didn't really look particularly threatening, but certainly the way they defended has been impressive, albeit... Uh, Sarpong Wiridu linked um, to a couple, of, a couple of clubs in the championship this week and he would obviously be a massive loss if he mm. were to move on. Although apparently, uh, per one Sunday scouting report, uh, Zach Medley looked very good at the back for them. Uh, big defender, yeah. I think. Former Arsenal guy, isn't he? Yeah, he is a former Arsenal guy. I think but it was a lot of different good attributes to his game all sort of patched together to create what you might call a medley of mm. defensive attributes. God. And had a good debut. Barrow won crew nil, winning start for Stephen Clements, uh, thanks to a set piece goal uh, put in by Big Theo Vassell on debut. Nice delivery from Connor Mahoney, uh, as is his want with that lovely left peg. I think interesting call for Clements up top, going with uh, Aqua up front as expected, but Jed Garner uh, foiling him. That's not a phrase. <laughs> his foil. Yeah. Very much not foiling him. Trying to help him, if anything. Um, Dom Telford, an unused sub. So Telford's tricky, like, two years now, continues. Um, unused sub here. For, for Crew. only four shots in total is a bit of a red flag. They did come close a few times without scoring and, and some of them without ending up as, as sort of shots taken. Uh, Hemmings hit the bar with a header. That was their only shot inside the box. Tracy hit the post from range as well. Quite a few sort of nearly moments. Um, but I'd like to see them Im improve on that performance. Good win for Barrow. Chesterfield back in the league. Drew one all with Swindon on Friday night. They were dominant in the first half and ahead through Armando Dobro, who's a player we've been really yes. looking forward to watching in the EFL for a couple of years now. And then in the, in the second half, um, you could either make a case that Swindon massively improved. You could make a case that Chesterfield seemed to run out of gas somewhat. Um, maybe it's a bit of a both. What we do know is... Really fun goal from Will Wright, mm. who received the ball on halfway from his right centre-back role, chopped inside a defender, carried it, carried it, carried it, spanked it in the top corner, which pretty fun on opening night. Yeah. And Tramia nil, Notts County nil, was the only match that happened, by which I mean a nil-nil. And, and there's not nothing really to say apart from Notts County had a lot of the ball and looked more solid at the back than they have done. Slightly better chances for Notts, would you say? Slightly. Slightly better chances for Notts. Uh, we're on the fence there. Uh, see you back on Thursday for a betting show. Uh, on Friday, there'll be a new episode of Dear Ali and George. That yes. goes out on NTT20.com for our paid subscribers. We are putting those episodes on our Apple podcast feed as well. Again, that is... Uh, subscriber only and I would question why you would be doing the Apple subscription rather than the NTT20.com subscription on account of it being the same price but on account of you getting way more for your buck yeah. on the old NTT20.com yes. that's what we're pushing right now uh, thank you very much for listening, what fun this has been and it's great to be back with you remember that you can watch all of these pods on YouTube this season um, if you'd like to cheers and go well